the West Bank is not uh, the best environment for a child to grow up. It was uh, a very violent uh, environment, mm -hmm. uh, lots of persecution, oppression, and uh, as a child, uh, I, w I witnessed lots of violence uh, from uh, the Israeli occupation from one, one hand uh, and uh, from the other hand from uh, my own people uh, living in a, a very conservative uh, community. People always have expectations and one, whenever you break a rule, you are punished. Um, and uh, Palestinian factions uh, persecuting each other, uh, people, uh, neighbors uh, killing each other and uh, um, fighting each other. So uh, you can say in general as an uh, environment, when I look back, it wasn't the best uh, environment for a child uh, to grow up. In fact, everything around you just teach you and uh, lead you in one direction, to hate, to learn how to take revenge, uh, not to trust any authority, try to trust uh, and uh, rely on yourself. And uh, this is not the best uh, environment uh, for uh, a child or even a, a human being to live. In, in the West, very often we have the impression we hear about Palestinian children being, if, if you will, raised, almost raised to hate Israelis, and even beyond that, to hate Jews, not just Israelis in, in particular and that to be sort of schooled in the notion that martyrdom is one of the highest goals you can aspire to. Is that just propaganda or is that reality in terms of what goes on with children's education? There is propaganda and there is an uh, ideological dimension mm -hmm. of uh, this uh, hate. Um, and uh, also um, there are political reasons. The uh, political reasons uh, based on a huge misunderstanding. For example, to me as a child, when I uh, used to see an Israeli so soldier shooting at my friends and even myself, to me, uh, beside the propaganda of the society, uh, he was my enemy. Now, I never get the chance to ask myself why he's doing this. And uh, I never get a chance to step in his shoes as a soldier uh, doing his duty to protect his country, even the interests of his country. Uh, I only saw the things in one direction, that this is my enemy. Now, this is the political uh, side of uh, uh, my judgment. Now, there were ideological side that it was in my heart and I got rid of it, which is Islam. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and I know this is politically incorrect, but this is the truth, that the God of Islam himself hates Jews. Uh, he hated them because they didn't obey him, and he converted them, regarding to the Quran, into uh, monkeys and uh, pigs. Well, this is what the Quran right. says. So, let me, let me so, if, if it's okay, if I could interrupt you, just because I, I do want to get to this a little bit later, if that's okay, uh, because I'm very interested in what you have to say about, uh, about Islam. But I, I, I just wanted to go back. If we but this could. is the ideological. This is what no, I no, mean. no. And I understand that the influence. I'm just. Uh, I guess what I wanted to do, if it's okay, is to focus a little bit more, to sort of do it a little bit chronologically, and start, you know, with, because uh, that's a conclusion you came to, a little later, bit later, yeah. a little bit later in your in your life. What What about the issue of martyrdom, though? You know, to what extent is that held out for young Palestinians growing up as some kind of a, of a goal? And another question that I'm curious about is. Does that include the high-ranking Palestinian? And you were brought up in a well-known family, in a very respected family. Would martyrdom ever possibly have been in your future, or is that for other families? So what's the dynamic there? What are kids taught, and how does it lead to where they wind up? Um, you know, the, the highest authority of that back, the highest authority of that society uh, prays uh, uh, the, shaheed. Pe the shaheeds and people who die for the glory mm -hmm. of Allah. It's a way of worship, especially if it's against uh, the Jews mm -hmm. and uh, infidels. So this is, uh, again, the uh, ideological dimension. And you felt yeah. that as a child. It was clear. It's, you taught that. Mm -hmm. you, uh, and the, you don't have even uh, to go to the mosque uh, to uh, learn it, because uh, whenever you read the Quran, if you believe in the Quran as the mm -hmm. book of uh, God Almighty, you read it, it's there. And uh, it's obvious, uh, his uh, remarks against uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish people and uh, infidels. 
So uh, political reasons, ideological reasons, and the entire society as a result praise suicide bombers, praise people who fight for the glory of Allah, uh, for the name of resistance as a nationalism uh, or national reason. Now, um, Muslims in, in general, uh, some, some people are taking advantage of the poor uh, conservative uh, Muslims and they might send them to death. But this is not enough to say that it's exclusive for the poor yes, uh, class because uh, even Hamas leaders themselves were killed and people praised them and their s sons mm -hmm. were killed as well and they lost their family members in this, in this war. So uh, they have uh, um, justification for what they're doing and uh, it's, uh, it's not easy to criticize them this way by saying... Um, it's only one level of society. Yeah, it's uh, almost every level it's of everywhere. society. So let me ask you, so when we see uh, pictures after a suicide bomber blows himself or herself up and we see the, the tent, you know, the mourning tent uh, afterwards, mm -hmm. and when they interview people, the people will say how proud they are that their son or occasionally daughter, mm -hmm. you know, did that. Are, are they, and I know it's, you can't read everybody's mind, but to what extent is that an honest expression of how they feel? Or to what expression is that for public consumption because they're sitting there with their neighbors and they would be afraid and what they're really feeling in their heart is, I wish that had never happened. Yes. Um, I don't have to read every individual's uh, mind to be able to understand this. I can uh, uh, learn about the spirit of the entire uh, society. Mm -hmm. If the highest authority of that society justifies this, with what authority an individual will come and uh, I understand. go against this? So there is uh, the factor of uh, shame, there is a factor of guilt, there is a factor of fear. There, is, uh, uh, there are uh, many factors uh, that they play that nobody wants to go against them. Now even, uh, and there is a hypocrisy that uh, many families are not willing to send their children to die and they are not willing to die for, for anybody. Um, and they still go to the tents and praise suicide bombers because this way they think they will be accepted by their society. This way they know that they are not condemned by condemning the, something wrong. Mm -hmm. The entire society I construction is built on two factors, two main factors, shame and guilt. I see. Not on good and bad. Mm -hmm. So if, even if it's wrong, but uh, not shameful, people still are willing to do it and praise it. So it sounds like what you're saying, and I guess that's hard for us in the West because, especially in the United States, we put such a big emphasis on individuality and personal conscience. And what you're saying is that the, the group, the society, has much stronger hold yes. on what people think. So maybe they can't even divide in their own mind between what they think personally and what's going on in the society because it's so much part of the same for them. E exactly. The society values are much stronger than any constitution, any law and even uh, individual uh, Personal conscience. conscience, right. Um, at 18 was your first serious arrest. I know you were arrested uh, you know, as a child, but this was the first uh, arrest as, as an adult. And although it's difficult to hear, I, I, I think it would be unfair if I don't ask you uh, how you were treated and, and what were the circumstances of your arrest, uh, what would happen as you were being transported um, to, I think it was to a, a jail in the, Russian, in the Russian compound, and then when you actually got there. Uh, first of all, please understand uh, the difference between uh, a mistake that was made by uh, a soldier who had maybe his own uh, reasons and uh, uh, a state policy. Mm -hmm. I was beaten, I was tortured. Now, um, I was beaten by Israeli soldiers, young Israeli soldiers. They view me as a terrorist, as a, uh, somebody who wants to harm the state of Israel. And they thought maybe by beating me, by torturing me, you know, they're doing a favor to their state. Um, just a uh, young uh, and uh, immature uh, group of uh, soldiers did that. And uh, that wasn't uh, the Israeli uh, policy. Uh, I am sure if they were caught, uh, they would uh, be uh, absolutely uh, uh, sent to the court. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, there was different type of torture, psychological torture, if you can uh, say, uh, of not letting uh, the person sleep for a long time. And uh, Israel, as uh, I am not defending Israel today, but when I step into their shoes in this uh, crazy war against terrorism as a small country, I understand where they're coming from. And uh, it's a very dirty uh, war. 
And uh, sometimes uh, uh, if any country, if any uh, agency would step into their shoes and think, what could we do if we were in the same position? Uh, sometimes Israel had no choice but to put pressure on some terrorists to get information. Mm -hmm. And I was a poten potential terrorist against that time, uh, during that time. And uh, I totally, deep in my heart, I forgive, not because I worked for the Shem Beit later on, but deep in my heart, I forgive because I understood where they were coming from. And uh, I hope that uh, peace will come soon to the region and nobody has to do anything bad to the, to the other. Going back to that, though, a little bit, you said that you see that as the actions of, let's say, overzealous young soldiers rather than a, a state policy. And you may not be in a position to answer this question, but how common do you think um, that the treatment that you received, how common is that with respect to other suspected terrorists? Do you think that the, what you underwent was very unusual or that it was fairly normative for what happens in Israeli jails? Well, it depends on the, uh, on the uh, escalation of viol violence uh, on both sides. Uh, some years, um, it's, it's fine, and uh, other years, uh, it's not fine at all, uh, and uh, it gets dangerous. Uh, I remember uh, at some point, my Shembet uh, handler told me, uh, I, as, as a person he was talking to me, I, that he had a feeling that he wants to take his gun and just go downtown Ramallah and start to shoot uh, everywhere because he was witnessing uh, the death of at least 25 uh, uh, civilians, women, children. During the height of people. the Intifada. Yes. During the Intifada in West Jerusalem who were killed in a suicide uh, bombing attack. And uh, now uh, some people, uh, if there is a soldier who lost a family member, who lost a friend uh, during this war, uh, uh, we are talking about a war zone, and you cannot control the emotions of every uh, person. Evil is there inside every uh, person, mm -hmm. and uh, it can be provoked if the political situation is not uh, 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 stable, or if there is a, a war, like the Second yes. Palestinian Intifada. So you're saying basically it's an emotional reaction that in calmer times, even though the arrests do go on, that the treatment that they can expect is different from what happens when people feel that, you know, every day or every every week there was another attack and then it, it just heightens the way that people respond. Yes. I understand. Uh, now we will get to Islam. I didn't want uh, to, you know, to put it off. Uh, you had a major interview with Christiane Anampour, uh in on, on CNN. And I, I want to quote uh, something that you that you said and then ask you about it and it speaks to this issue of Islam. You said the main gangster is the God of Islam and the motive, the real motive, is not by fanatic Muslims. It's in the Quran that moderate and fundamentalist Muslims read. So what I'd like to understand is why you feel particularly that Islam is the source, let's say, of the Hamas behavior that you saw rather than just saying, all right, there have been terrorist organizations in the past that Hamas is primarily a nationalist uh, organization. They may be Islamic, but they're basically nationalists, and that's why they behave the way they do. But you seem to feel strongly that it's rooted in Islam rather than politics. Why is that? I, I was born in the heart of uh, Hamas uh, leadership, and uh, I know their uh, limits. They are very limited to the ideology and the teachings uh, of the Quran and uh, the uh, teachings of Muhammad. And uh, I know that uh, some of them are good people. Even they are involved in a terrorist organization on the personal level, they're just human beings and they are mo not more than victims of their own beliefs. Uh, my father is one of the best, that Hama best people that Hamas can uh, offer, forgiving person, uh, uh, trying to uh, work uh, together with his people to help him uh, uh, during a difficult uh, situation. And uh, this person still involved in Hamas uh, movement. Now, I see in him as a person that he has logics, he has uh, morals, uh, more than the teachings of Islam. Uh, so they, uh, what I figure out after a long time of fighting terrorism, of being uh, uh, a devoted uh, Muslim, and uh, practicing uh, Islam, going to Islamic uh, Sharia law school, and uh, knowing enough about the religion, uh, that our problem, my problem, is not with Muslims. In fact, what I'm doing today, I'm trying to bring them liberty. You mean not with Muslims as people, as individuals? As people, as individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem starts with their uh, God, with their prophet. 
they are following the lead of their God and their prophet. And uh, uh, I understood, I studied more than any uh, uh, average Muslim, let's say, about what Islam is all about. And I know the real nature of Islam, I know the personality of uh, Muhammad and the personality of the God of Islam. And uh, Now when you say, if I might interrupt, when you say the God of Islam, again as a Westerner that's it's hard to sort of put into context, even though my own religious faith is, came out of the Middle East, not out of, uh, mm -hmm. out of the West. But we don't usually think about God as having a personality or one God being different. I mean, the, the, the God of Islam, at least historically, was the same God of the Jews and the God of the, the Christians, the same monotheistic. In fact, as I understand Islam, they are very strong on the monotheistic issue. That's why they have so much trouble with Christianity, because they consider, it, they consider Jesus and the Holy Spirit to be multiple, you know, multiple gods. So are we really talking about the God of Islam, or are we talking about Muhammad's interpretation of God? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, the God of Islam exists in, in the Quran, mm -hmm. That's first of all. Second, to many Muslims, they think that he is God Almighty. Mm -hmm. And we talk about God for anybody who believes in God Almighty. Uh, we refer to uh, the God who created the universe. Right. Now, uh, why I uh, distinguish, why I make the difference between the God of the Quran and the God of the Bible? Because if we uh, personalize characterize this God, like have him into a person and see how he is going to behave, we will find two different personalities. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, the God of the Bible, we know him through the person of Christ. I'm not here to discuss religions, but through the person of Christ, mm -hmm. we know how this God looks like and what he does. Uh, he's a loving, forgiving, mm -hmm. to uh, the end of the picture that Christianity presents about God. Now, in Islamic uh, case, we understand the God of the Quran through the personality of Muhammad, through how he acted. Did he kill? Yes, he did. Did he rape? Yes, he did. Did he invade other uh, civilizations and destroy them and uh, stole everything and built his empire on that? Yes, he did personally. Now, if this is the type of God that mandates this type of actions and his prophet or his messenger did all of it, this gives Muslims uh, the right mm -hmm. to do it. So today, Bin Laden, when he's trying to conquest the entire world and build an Islamic global state, he's not, this is not his personal understanding of the Quran. It's what Muhammad did, and what the God of the Quran mandates in the Quran, and what Muhammad did practically in the Hadith. So f for that, when I say the God of Islam, this is uh, the real nature of that God, torture, mm -hmm. killer, uh, ask his followers to kill. But as described by Muhammad in, in the Quran? As it's described in the Quran and in the Hadith as a second uh, main uh, source uh, for Islam. Obviously your father had a tremendous influence in terms of your earlier understanding of Islam. Mm -hmm. And because in the West we're always interested in the role of women and the differences and roles of women in different cultures. In the book you mention your, your, your dad a lot and what you learned from him. You do mention your mother but not so much in the context of shaping your your beliefs. Did your mother have a role in, in your early beliefs in shaping your understanding of Islam or that was not the role of the mother in the family? Yes, uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, my mother played a big uh, role in this because uh, she studied uh, Sharia as well and uh, she used to have uh, what they call Jalsa for you know us as children and uh, teach us about the Quran, about Islam, about uh, the followers of Muhammad and uh, the expectations uh, from us since we were children. My name is Musab, it's, uh, and uh, when you look at the Islamic history, you'll find that Musab is the first Islamic ambassador uh, that Muhammad sent to other nations. Uh, my other brother's uh, name is uh, Suhaib, who left all his uh, fortune and uh, wealth and followed Muhammad. Uh, my other uh, brother is uh, Uwais, and he's one of uh, the greatest uh, Muhammad's followers. So they named us after the names of uh, the greatest uh, uh, Muslim Islamic leaders. Islamic leaders uh, to remind us always that we have expectations from you at some point that you are going to lead the community and spread the message of Islam to the world. When you think about Islam, not only its impact in uh, Palestine and in Israel, but when you look at Islam around the world, you're obviously very aware of the problems in Europe and the tensions that are created between the Christian or atheist, depending on who they are, majorities in uh, various European countries and a growing uh, Islamic 
minority. Mm -hmm. And people talk about a cultural confrontation between the West and the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is paranoia or do you think that that is a reality of life right now? In fact, I don't think that this is a cultural uh, c clash. Mm -hmm. I think it's ideological clash. It starts in the books and uh, uh, for uh, the main uh, religions. Uh, unfortunately, maybe most religions are not in a war with Islam, but what is confirmed that Islam is in a war with other religions. Now, what, uh, uh, but let me say, what, ex expand on that. When you say that Islam is in a war with other religions, usually a war has a goal. What's the goal of that war? Islam's goal on earth, and this is before heaven, mm -hmm. to establish what, called, uh, what is called Khilafah, which means an Islamic global state that is ruled by one Muslim leader. Now, uh, even if the, uh, this will cost humanity uh, any price, it doesn't matter. This is... Uh, uh, it's the ideal. This is a duty from the God of the Quran, in the Quran, for every Muslim to go and spread Islam, and if they have to use the sword, they are allowed to use the sword. If people will not resist and they accept Islam, they, don't, they are not required to use the sword. Now, their model in this is their prophet. The problem that their prophet practically used the sword to spread his message and killed people who disagreed with him. So today, all the followers of Islam, if they follow the lead of Muhammad, they, it will be justified to them because their model, their highest authority, uh, and everybody knows what Muhammad means to the Muslim nation, we will understand that it's justified regarding to their religion. That's why I say that Islam in a war with the other, not only Christian Jews, with the other, anybody who doesn't believe in Islam as the only solution for life, they are on the target list. So, so therefore you think that European countries are facing a problem as their, their Muslim minorities grow? Yeah, absolutely, but it's a different type of problem. If we can transfer uh, or convert the problem from European, uh, African or European, Asian, European, Muslim uh, conflict into ideas, conflict of ideas, and expose the real nature of Islam. This is the reality of Islam. First of all, for Muslims to understand the real nature of their religion because the majority of Muslims don't understand the real nature of Islam. They were born Muslims and they don't want to get out of their uh, comfortable zone by converting to something else or by criticizing their own religion. Because of that, the majority of Muslims say Islam is a religion of peace and they are trying to convince everybody because this is more comfortable for them. Now, if Muslims un start to understand the real nature of Islam, of their own religion, of their own Quran, that they read it and they don't understand it, by the way, they will know that Islam is their biggest enemy. And then it will not be a problem. Their biggest enemy the in terms of development as individuals, in terms of getting, in terms of their, their society, it's the biggest enemy of their society. Yes, absolutely, because it's... Uh, of uh, progress. Uh, yeah. There is no progress. They cannot be creative while they are enslaved for ideas like cutting arms and uh, cutting necks and uh, killing the other. Well, so let me ask you though, there are many Muslims around the world who are very highly educated and very sophisticated people. Mm -hmm. Why do we not see more people doing what you've done in terms of abandoning Islam? It happens, I mean you read, uh, obviously it does happen, but you don't get the sense that there's any big movement out of Islam. So how is it that you came to that conclusion but others did not? Yes, because this is not a matter of education, it's a matter of faith. And it's a matter of, uh, if I can say, courage. Unfortunately, most people, they are educated, and uh, I am sure that they have uh, plenty of questions. But what everybody knows, that if you go against the will of the highest authority of that society, you are going to lose your family, you will be rejected, you will bring lots of shame, on yourself and on your grand-grandchildren to come and you will be totally isolated and you might be killed. So in general, even if you are... Uh, if you're inclined in that direction. Yeah, and I if there will be the most educated person, maybe he would be the most person to be afraid for his future and for his position and they want mm -hmm. nobody wants to go down uh, this difficult road. Let let's go back a little bit to your personal history. So 18 years old, you were in you were in prison. And then there was 
and I understand it was over time, a, a gradual evolution in your thinking. You were approached by the Shin Bet to become an operative. Now, you talk about the fact in your book that originally your reason for wanting to cooperate was because you were hoping to be a double agent. In other words, you were not cooperating not because you wanted to help the Shin Bet, because you felt that you could sort of outsmart the, the Shin Bet, and you would be, they would think that you're working for them, but you're really working against them, and that the, the information that they supply you with then becomes something for Hamas to have to work with. Yeah. But at some point, you, you changed, and you began to think about it uh, differently. So how did that happen? What was the process that caused you to abandon that original intention and then to work with Shin Bet in a different way? The process, first of all, was uh, your self-integrity. Are you looking for the truth in general? And since I was a child, I, I was questioning many things in Islam, in the society, and trying to find where the problem starts. Now, uh, when I, was, when I uh, agreed to work for the Shin Bet, my goal was to take revenge from the Shin Bet in order to serve my people. My idea was, by harming the Shin Bet, just harming them, not getting information or doing anything sophisticated, but harming them as Jewish people, I serve my people. And this is how many people are victims to the uh, cycle of revenge, because they think by harming the other, they're taking revenge to their own uh, uh, nation. So that was the idea. Now later on, um, and this is also what my dad taught me, to look for the truth and uh, question, ask questions and uh, uh, be courageous about things, uh, which is weird that I learned this from uh, my father who is part of Hamas. And this will show you that even some people uh, in the Hamas movement, they have qualities that they're good qualities. And the picture is not white and black. Now, later on, I start to learn the truth from my enemies who I wanted to kill. And I found that my enemies, who I wanted to infiltrate, to fool, and uh, to destroy, they had integrity more than my own people, more than the organization of my father. That why, why do you say that? Why, did they, why do you think they had more integrity? Uh, through the years that worked, of course, you know, this is not a, a one-day one trans right. one-time transformation. Uh, we had uh, long experience, uh, uh, many years working. I saw uh, that they never broke a promise. I want to say they, uh, the Israeli Shembet, uh, whatever promise they had, they kept their promise. At some level, I trusted them with the life of my father. Why my father was on a, the hit list of the Shembet, because I was working for the Shembet, and for my position, they saved my father's life, and I trusted them with. Out of regard for you. Yes. And that was their promise, that we will protect your dad no matter what. And uh, for that reason, you know, you can say that there is a level of integrity. Uh, my father to them is an enemy, and simply they could target him any way, any time. And they knew about his location, most of the uh, per second Palestinian intifada. So this is what we learned, that there is integrity. You know, how much they cared about me. I was in, uh, many times I put my life in danger. And there was uh, troops, there was uh, uh, Israeli forces who were there to protect my back. And uh, always I, I was uh, protected in any operation. Now, uh, on the other side, unfortunately, I saw that Hamas claims that, she, uh, that they want to uh, uh, liberate the Palestinian and build a Palestinian state in order to bring Palestinian justice, but they didn't care about any Palestinian individual. They tortured their own people, they killed their own people, they judged each other, and they were very selfish, the way that they dealt with each other when they had a, a mini-government in prison. And since then, I start to ask my question. Uh, my that was the Majad? When that was Megiddo, uh, Israeli prison. Hamas was no, the, the group, I thought. Uh, uh, the Majd, the Majd, yeah, the Majd, the Hamas security wing. So uh, Ismail Haniyeh, mm -hmm. the Palestinian mm -hmm. uh, pr president, he used to be the chief of the Majd, by the way, uh. during that time. And I start to ask myself a question. Why do I hate the Israelis for torturing me? And why don't I hate Hamas for torturing my people? Torture is torture. So why it's double standard? And uh, after that, I start to ask myself, what if Hamas at some point controls the Palestinian people and build a state? Will that, that state, future state, that was back in 1996, will that future state 
uh, be the same as Hamas state in prison. And today, Ismail Haniyeh, the Hamas uh, Majd uh, chief, he is the Palestinian Hamas prime minister in Gaza Strip. And you go and look at Gaza Strip, you are going to find the same exact example that was happening in prison 15 years ago. The same exact example. Same style. Same, same style on a much higher scale. One of the things you describe in the book is that the Shin Bet was very free with money. You were able to go to, to school and all. And, and I know you've been asked this uh, many, many times. But one of the first things that people assume when somebody takes money for something like this is that they're doing it primarily uh, for the money. So how, how would you respond or how do you respond when someone says, well, you know, I look at this, you know, yes, he says he's ideological, but he, he got all these benefits from Shin Bet. Well, I'm not in a position to defend uh, myself. First of all, that was a job. And uh, I was taking a fee as, as a job. Most of that fee was going usually to uh, car rental, to operations, to gas, to uh, phones or things like that. Because the amount that uh, was uh, paid is a very small uh, amount. If I became rich from that job, you know, and I have a long list of people that I'm responsible for uh, their death and uh, betrayal, as they say, then it will be a different story. You're saying they weren't paying you enough to and make it uh, no, a, no, a no, bribe. No, this no, is, this is not my point. What I'm saying that, you know, first of all, uh, we saved lots of lives, you know, including uh, people who are willing to kill me today. And uh, a traitor who t betrayed his people for money wouldn't have that uh, more. No, I understand. I, I guess what I was saying was that if you really were doing it for money, then you wouldn't have done it for the kind of money you got. You, you know, people who do it for money do it for very large amounts of, of, of money. And yeah, if it was, if it was, no, no amount was enough to uh, to convince me just to work for Israel. Right. If it if was there hadn't only been ideological, about, right. about money. And uh, why did I leave after that? I exposed myself. I wasn't exposed. Then if it was the reason for the money, why didn't I stay? Well, I think and the best <laughs> argument is is that if it had only been for the money, you wouldn't have been foolish enough to put it in your book. So it's <laughs> okay. Because, you know, why would you, you know, you know it's, you this is not even an issue, but yeah. for people who are curious, you know, people will judge anyway. And I'm not, I'm not bothered by judgment. You know, you said in, in what I thought was very interesting in one of the interviews with, when the interview with CNN, you said that you weren't working for the Sheen Betts agenda, they were working for your uh, agenda. Now that seems a little egotistical, so you have to tell me what you mean by that. Yes, in, in fact, uh, when uh, sometimes uh, an interviewer, you know, uh, they uh, push you into the corner and uh, they just put you in a positive, uh, uh, defensive uh, position, um, you have to say things. Uh, my, my, my point wasn't that the Shimbit worked for me. Mm -hmm. My point was that I wasn't working for their agendas, you know, as a slave. You know, this is the idea of a mole or somebody who is uh, working for uh, the enemies, nice. that they are paid and they, they have been enslaved. Uh, with the Shimbit, there was a partnership. We used to sit on the table, discuss every issue, what's good, what's bad, and that what and we had a, a common sense that it, it used to be our uh, scale that we weigh things on. It wasn't like, go do this, go do that, it's your job, and you cannot discuss. Every time, uh, and many, many times, I, I had ideas that uh, they were uh, my ideas. It wasn't the Shimbet ideas. In fact, sometimes it was against the Shimbet policy and uh, they accept to work for that uh, through that strategy and it worked very well and we were very successful so today when i look at the back and uh, at the past and uh, i don't see myself that i was working for the shimbe we were working together I see. Uh, in order to bring uh, peace and uh, stop violence in the in the region now you you're you're by no means the only palestinian who's ever cooperated uh, with Israeli uh, authorities, although I assume that there are many people, probably innocent, who are executed for suspected cooperation that never had anything to do with it. But there clearly are people who are cooperating. W wh why do you think that the Israeli authorities, Shin Bet and others, are so successful, leaving, leaving aside your case, why do you think they are so successful in getting people to leak information to them? Um, in fact, um, we need to understand that there are uh, lots of mistakes on the other uh, side. Other side meaning? Uh, meaning Hamas, meaning Palestinian uh, factions. Uh, this is from one side. From other side, Israel uh, is uh, Israeli intelligence. I believe it's one of the best intelligence services in the world, I believe, personally. 
um, there are strong points that uh, they uh, rely on the human resources. Uh, human uh, eye can see and uh, there is a brain that can analyze and think and feel and smell. Uh, a camera and the technology uh, resources uh, can see but maybe can't uh, understand and uh, analyze uh, information. Uh, the Israeli intelligence, uh, one of the most important uh, uh, strong points that they, are, they rely on the human resources. Uh, second, they rely on technology. Uh, third, they understand the culture, they understand the mindset of terrorists, they understand the ideological dimension of that war, and they understand the language. They understand almost everything about that society. Right, but let me stop you. But what motivates, I understand that, and, and I think a lot of people would agree, but the person who, who decides to cooperate, mm -hmm. what's on that person's mind? Because you said that you understand the mentality, obviously, of the people that you grew up with. So. Leaving aside, you have ideological motivations. What are the motivations of the people who cooperate with the Israelis? Some people do it for money. And uh, I guarantee you that the people who do this type of job for money don't provide the Shem Beit with important information because they will be from the low level of the society. I see. And they don't have access to sensitive information. Uh, now, the uh, higher class uh, people who work for the Shem Beit uh, either they have ideological reasons or they have problem with the society and they do it uh, with the motivation of uh, uh, taking revenge. Anger. For anger. They are persecuted by the society and they are willing to work with the Israelis as a democratic country at the end of the day, as a modern uh, country and state, uh, give them a, a motive to work against uh, the wrong people, the, the wrong uh, uh, people and teachings. So everybody has different uh, motivation. Now, the ideological motivation, uh, and this is not how I started, but this is, I think, the most effective uh, uh, people or active uh, uh, agents who work when they have ideological uh, motivation, like stopping the bloodshed no matter what. Uh, even if they risk uh, their own uh, lives. And I reach uh, this uh, level, not from the beginning. From the beginning, my motive was to take revenge for my people. But uh, a few years after, um, I became ideologically motivated uh, because to me, it was to stop blood no matter what. Uh, if it's uh, for the Palestinian agenda or the Israeli agenda, I didn't care. And all I cared about humanity. And when became that became my focus, we were the most successful because I could put my life for real in a very dangerous situation to a level that I could get killed several times. And the Shem Beit files are witnessing for this. To get to that level, no money, no position, nothing will convince you to be in that situation. I know that many people quit working for the Shem Beit during the time that many agents uh, or even suspicious people were executed in public. Everybody was terrified, and I didn't lose faith because I had ideological... Um, I understand. Now, you know there are people who are sometimes critical of, of what you wrote, of the veracity of, of what you wrote. And, and you, you were, the day after you were interviewed by Christiane uh, Amanpour, she then put on, I don't know if you ever read the, the transcript, but she had th uh, three people on the next day yeah. to reflect on, on what you had said. One was um, uh, Yossi Melman, you know, who has written extensively about uh, Israel's security and spy networks, who said, uh, you know, he used the word slightly exaggerated. Then we had, I'm just reading the name, uh, Fawaz uh, Gerges, I guess, is from the London School of Economics. He said, you're exaggerating a lot. And then you had, of course, you know, Osama Hamdan, who said that you weren't in a position that they'd known since you were 17 years old, that you were going the wrong way, and that they never allowed you to come anywhere near uh, anything. I assume that also implies that they kept you alive because of your father, but because if they thought you were a spy otherwise, I suppose you wouldn't be sitting here with me. F first of all, you know, uh, this will tell you that uh, uh, we were uh, really successful of uh, keeping a very good uh, cover. Mm -hmm. And uh, for many years working for the Shem Beit, uh, I never uh, been asked to be a Hamas leader or to be even uh, a person who gets lots of attention. That this is not the best person who can work for an intelligence service. To be close enough is much better than being involved. 
being involved. Okay, you carry an operation. All your friends are arrested. What are you doing outside of jail? You have to go and spend the five or ten years like everybody else. Then what are you doing in jail? But if you are close enough and you get information without getting involved, this will give you much more space. And you will spend most of your time working on the field instead of being somewhere in jail. Now, for the experts, and whoever said that, uh, whoever said that, I mean, who says they're experts? Uh, that I am exaggerating. Yeah. Seriously, what type of information that uh, they have? Uh, so when was the last time that they uh, got the chance to sit down with uh, a Shimbet uh, agent and uh, interview them? And uh, what, what, what's their resources? Is it uh, media? Is it uh, books and uh, reading? Uh, if it's books, this means uh, it's uh, 50 years uh, old information. So you're saying it's just speculation. And uh, so, um, and then uh, the, what was uh, really fascinating about their judgment, uh, that they uh, passed their judgment, next day of the release of the book, in fact, same day of release of the book, which means that they never got the chance to read the book. So based on what? What the Shembet said about me? Then go criticize the Shembet. I never said that I uh, saved hundreds of lives. It's not in my book. Which, which is true, but I never claimed that. I never made the, even I, I mentioned few amount of the operations. My Shembet handler uh, confessed to, uh, for the first time, uh, with exposing his identity and said all this information. And now their judgment was passed based on what was said uh, in the media, I not see. what I personally said. So uh, this is just a small response uh, to them. Uh, they're just, uh, uh, with all respect to everybody, uh, their experience is very, uh, very poor, and they're away from. Uh, and Osama really Hamdan was was politically motivated in, in what he said. Um, Osama Osama Hamdan's whole point was that this is an Israeli propaganda. I see. <laughs> it's, so it's like, how can you, you, you? We don't have even to respond to him because we, we, he was coming from that Israel made and the Shem Beit made this uh, book made it in, in, in in less than one month and publicize it just to cover for the uh, assassination of Mahmoud al-Mabhuh in, uh, in, uh, Dubai. in Dubai. So simply uh, his point was uh, very, very uh, uh, weak. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the book took uh, us uh, two years to write, first of all. Second, the Shem Beit was the last to know. And I am telling you that the Shem Beit was not pleased with me exposing myself, exposing my identity, my Shembet handler exposing himself, and going public with a book that details might harm the operations of the Shembet. So uh, Osama Hamdan would come, uh, um, the last person, and uh, say, uh, this is a Shembet uh, propaganda. What Sh Hamas understands about the Shembet, and what even uh, all experts understand about the Shembet. I guarantee you, the Shembet and Hamas, uh, if uh, uh, experts, Hamas uh, leaders know how the Shembet operates and how the Shembet uh, agents look like and what they do. The Shembet wouldn't be uh, successful. You know, you, you, you grew up in the West Bank. You're a Palestinian by, by birth, uh, a Christian now, but you grew up in is Islamic culture. But let me ask you a little bit about the bigger question about Israel and its uh, existence in, in the Middle East. I, if I asked you, do you think it is appropriate that Israel be a Jewish state? In other words, are you comfortable with the idea of Israel existing as a Jewish state in the Middle East? And I ask you because, as you know, as part of the peace negotiation, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu raised that as, I believe, one of his, pri as his price to freeze the settlements, I think, uh, more permanently. He asked that uh, Mahmoud Abbas say that not only that he recognizes Israel, which could be interpreted as, I recognize Israel, but I know one day it's going to be an Arab state, versus I recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Where do you stand on that issue? I think uh, when uh, Mr. Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu asked that, he didn't, uh, that wasn't the biggest issue, you know, that the state of Israel is facing. Uh, this uh, would show the heart of uh, the Palestinian leadership because they claim that they are partners in the uh, peace uh, process. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they deny on a daily basis the Jewish people right mm -hmm. of that land. And how do you feel? Uh, I personally cannot go against uh, history. I personally studied history. I personally study the Bible on a daily basis and uh, I know what's uh, in there. And uh, I think this is the time for uh, Palestinians at least to recognize the historical right for uh, the Jewish uh, nation of that land. 
If they start to understand that, uh, they will start to see the picture from a different uh, point of view. Uh, the problem is not uh, only a political uh, problem. It's not about settlements uh, freeze. It's about uh, if there is uh, a real uh, uh, partnership. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas comes to the uh, Jewish uh, community here in the United States and says, I recognize the uh, Jewish uh, historical right of uh, the Holy Land. But in Ramallah, he doesn't say such a thing. And I think there is a huge hypocrisy in this. And this is why we're having the problem. Educate your people and let them know that there were, at some point, Jewish kingdom, not a state, in this land. And as you are motivated by your Quran, by your books, and you think that you have religious and uh, uh, basis, yeah. ba basis and right, think about the other, because they have the same. And if we don't understand each other, it's going to end like a graveyard for everybody. Let me conclude with a couple of just a little more personal questions. And I, I'm sure this is painful for you, but you were publicly disowned by your family. Do you see that as something that came from the heart or something that to a certain extent, meaning the, either the heart or out of conviction, or to what extent do you think they did that out of fear? Because you talked about the need to fit in and the need to be part of a society. This is just to show you the picture, um, how difficult for anybody, for any person, to get out from that box, from their comfortable zone. Um, because one of the uh, most dangerous consequences that you are going to lose everything, your family. Now, uh, the heart of my dad, how come a father can disown his son from his heart or hate his son? So you're saying that's not possible? And uh, I know uh, through uh, uh, some resources, not directly from my dad, you know, that he said, I can't hate him, you know, and he was totally uh, weeping and uh, it was very hard for his heart that he disowned me. My mother disagreed totally with the decision, mm -hmm. but he finally took the decision on his own under the pressure of Hamas uh, uh, leadership. Um, but this will show you also, if my father, a leader of that community, a top leader of Hamas, very powerful leader, couldn't stand in the storm of shame and he had no choice but to disown his son to save his family, to save himself. How can we blame a normal or average person in that society if their son comes to a conclusion like this or a decision like this? They will be totally smashed. This is why one of the challenges that I had, that I had to destroy the wall of shame, of guilt, of fear, I personally asked my dad a few days before uh, the release of my book, I asked him, please disown me. I told him, please disown me. He told me, this is not an option. No matter what you do, no matter you did, I am not going to disown you. Two days after, I heard from the news, not from him, which will tell you his heart, and which will tell you how hard it is for a father to be in the same position and for a son. I knew the consequences. I knew them very well. That's why I asked him to disown me. Uh, but uh, why did I do this? This was the real challenge. The real challenge not to write the book. The real challenge not uh, what was the motivation. The real challenge was to cross all the red lines of a so society that is enslaved to shame, guilt, and fear. And I broke all the uh, lines in order to open the door for the new generation. If they have, I'm sure that they are much better people than me in the Middle East, much better thinkers, and uh, people who are willing t to move, and they wanted an example. I just gave them the example, and I hopefully this will open the gate for uh, many others to come. Musab, do you think you'll ever see them again and be reconciled yes. with them? Yes, yes. I will see them again. We will be together again. And uh, whatever it is. In takes, this world? In this, in world. this, in this world, I, I totally believe. Uh, a, I, as I said before, what's, what's between us? Is it, is it Islam? Is this the wall between us? If it takes to destroy Islam totally in order to get back to my family, I am willing to keep working day and night for this cause to get back to my dad. Mm -hmm.